Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin with the Mises Institute, and with me is my co-host, Tho Bishop. Well, it's been a couple of weeks since the election, so we're going to check in on uh, the transition team and some of their appointments and really look at what is the reality of this administration going to be in terms of where they're headed in uh, at least foreign policy. That's where most of the new uh, appointments are coming in. And so we can get a sense of where things are headed uh, with that. Still too early, I think, to say much about domestic policy, except maybe on immigration with the, uh, the appointment of Homan, Homan as the, uh, uh, the border czar. And uh, <laughs> he's so over the top and in your face. Uh, people I talk to seem to find him quite thrilling, uh, but we won't talk about that much. Powerful aesthetics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they will mention him, uh, but uh, I think mostly we'll just talk about some of these uh, uh, Secretary of State app, uh, appointments and things like that. But uh, first, I just want to make sure that if you have not yet seen our new Fed documentary, make sure and check that out. You can see that anytime at Mises.org slash fire. Uh, the title is Playing with Fire. And it just really looks at how the Federal Reserve is the is both the nation's arsonist and fireman, basically creating all these problems that it later purports to solve, and really looking at what is the real record of America's central bank. And we've got all of our top guys on that. Jim Grant, Alex Pollack, our senior fellow, and of course, our head in-house economist, Joe Salerno, and then uh, one of our favorite guests, Jonathan Newman Hall all have a lot of great commentary in there about the Fed. And I think even if you read a lot of this stuff, you might learn a few things from the video or at least come away with some new ways of phrasing uh, or putting the problem with the Fed. And I liked, I liked a lot of the ways uh, that uh, the problem was really summarized by Jonathan and Joe especially. So it's 40 minutes long. And uh, it's pretty fast moving, so I think I think you may enjoy it if you have not seen it. So check it out. That's at Mises.org slash fire. And what else is going on, though? Well, one expert we could add to our sequel to Playing With Fire is John Rich of Big & Rich. Going out there calling for ending the Fed over the weekend. The vibes have definitely changed on the Federal Reserve topic in the, in the zeitgeist there. It was after the, the Powell, you can't fire me line. And so it kind of, kind of built up a little, uh, little momentum there for ending the Fed. It's a very timely film as well. Um, other things we got going on, though, is um, we just had our call out yesterday. You may have gotten an email if you're on our email list. And if you're not, you can subscribe at Mises.org at the top of the page. Great content. And we'll keep you up to date on everything we've got going on at the Mises Institute. Uh, but yesterday's email, if you are a student, listening to Radio Rothbard, and I know that there are many out there. Uh, you can win some money writing about Henry Hazlitt's economic in one lesson, the Kenneth Garcina undergrad student essay contest. This is always great every year. Uh, we have submissions from all around uh, the country, even a few ones internationally. Um, you know, you can win 1,500 uh, smackers if you take the top prize there. So definitely, Look at getting involved with that. If you uh, have a paper that you want to present as well, AERC is the place to do it. You can find information at Mises.org slash events. And of course, we're still looking forward to our Tampa event, which will start our 2025 event calendar. Uh, we're going to be talking about educating for liberty down in beautiful Tampa, Florida, thanks to the, the Schrader family and our great supporters down in the, uh, the Tampa area. Actually, Spencer Schrader, uh, was a kicker for the New York Jets, banged through uh, two field goals over the weekend, the only points the, the Jets scored. So I'm hoping that uh, he is sending Aaron Rodgers a link to playing with fire, money, banking, and Federal Reserve. We need to get him on that documentary as well. All right. Well, also, if you're just uh, listening in uh, this week, make sure and go uh, keep your eye on the CPI number today. I was just looking at that just now, and uh, it's ticking back up. You'll be shocked to find out that the Fed does not have the whole situation in hand. And of course, we're seeing yields heading back up too. So this this relates back to check out our earlier episodes on the economic problems that Trump is going to have to face at some point. Uh, price inflation 
ain't going away, yields heading up. Uh, we're, we're talking about foreign policy right now, but uh, I predict that uh, economic reality is going to intrude very much in 2025 into this administration, and we'll be talking about that, I think, more going forward. But what has the administration given us to talk about today? It is their appointments uh, to mostly foreign policy stuff has been getting most of the headlines. And yesterday was generally just a, it hasn't been all bad news since the administration came in. Um, but <laughs> yesterday, just the, the news about appointments was just garbage, uh, I think, from, from those of us who we're hoping to apply some pressure to the administration in terms of what personnel are you bringing in? We got Michael Waltz, uh, basically, right, a, a Bush and Cheney acolyte from the old days, saying with Elise Stefanik. These two, by the way, when they were in Congress, uh, voted against reigning in the power of the FISA courts. So like most people, most people with a neoconish streak, they also hate privacy and private property here in America. And this, of course, just reminds us that to be in favor of the warfare state is to be against freedom at home. I mean, this is just shown over and over and over again. Read Robert Higgs if you need extensive documentation of this, for example, crisis and Leviathan, but tons of work that Higgs has done. The, the close, intimate connection between war abroad and the destruction of liberty at home. So when we're talking about the bad positions that these people have on foreign policy, it virtually always also translates into support for horrific legislation like the USA Patriot Act, like support for increased FISA power, like support for the NSA, uh, unquestioning support for the CIA. This is this goes hand in hand with bureaucrats who also want to see aggressive foreign policy. Overseas, So that's always just a safe assumption that whenever we're talking about these people have a bad position, maybe on the Middle East or on Israel or on Ukraine, they also have a bad position on basic freedoms at home. Uh, so let's just talk about, I don't know, let, <laughs> let's talk about little Marco. Well, why not just start off with, with the most well-known guy? And uh, now, of course, over the years, you haven't had a whole lot of nice things to say about Marco for a variety of different reasons, though. So what's so the the news came down yesterday that he was being considered for the position of secretary of state. It seems to me like that's a done deal, although some people still argue that this is actually kind of a trial balloon being floated. I don't know. Tell me what I need to know about this situation. Well, it is interesting, the fact that we've had a number of appointments come out, some of which were kind of leaked to the media around the same time as the Rubio for Secretary of State uh, idea came out. I think it was first reported by the New York Times, um, and it yet has not been confirmed. I, I, it does just seeming, kind of reading the tea leaves there, that there is some conversations going on there. Now, how much of that is dedicated to, you know, is it a done deal? And the delay is trying to figure out how to leverage the open Florida Senate seat, negotiations going on from you know, Mar-a-Lago and DeSantis world and things like that. Maybe that is the cause of the delay. Maybe there is a pushback there. Um, and, and I think there's a larger conversation to be had about kind of the different players out there. And uh, Donald Trump Jr., for example, has been very um, uh, vocal about trying to you know, push back against certain neoconservative influences. I think that played a role in the, the, the Haley and Pompeo uh, announcement over the weekend. Um, he's been fr very friendly with with Dave Smith and and some of our our guys out there in that land. So you know he's still trying to keep that fight going. It's it's a broader conversation there. Even if you looked at the other candidates there, you know, you kind of kind of pick your trade offs there. You have you have Rubio with with his record. You have uh, Rick Rinell, um, you know, who was the ambassador to Germany for some time. He was uh, I think serving kind of in an acting uh, national security advisor role in the second half of that administration. Um, you know, he, he has kind of long Republican, um, you know, he was, he was a Romney foreign policy advisor as well. I know he played a very active role in the anti-Assange stuff, so negatives there, but also has some very robust things to say about the, the bureaucracy of the Secretary of State, which had some people kind of interested in his, his candidacy. Um, you also had um, a senator from Tennessee, uh, Senator Haggerty, um, who was the ambassador to Japan, which was a very major kind of point of emphasis, you know, that very special relationship between uh, Trump and Abe that time around. So obviously, you know, I could see them having a strong relationship from that 
background. But if you look beyond that, you know, there's nothing particularly you know, unique, um, you know, something, anything out of the wild, anything that, that would surprise you from a kind of a generic Republican administration there. Um, and uh, Vivek Ramaswamy was mentioned as kind of a dark horse there. Obviously, he has been now um, kind of put an Elon Musk project with the Department of Government Efficiency, um, which we might talk about a little bit later. Um, so Ru Rubio, I think, kind of surprising to a certain extent because you think about you know, the 2016 campaign, you think about little Marco, you think about you know, the, the great gif of uh, great, great footage of, of Trump kind of pretending to, to drink water with like kind of a callback to uh, Rubio's infamous uh, uh, response to the State of the Union address uh, back when he was really uh, kind of the, the hot stuff with the Republican side. And, um, you know, when you look at Rubio, you know, it, it is worth noting that uh, I think when it comes to votes on Ukraine, he has been a lot less hawkish than one might have expected, given his early foreign policy views, where he seemed to be a, a full on, you know, I, I think he had staff that used to, I think his chief of staff originally was a former Dick Cheney guy, right? So you might see a, a little bit of moderation in some of his views when it comes to the Russia uh, Russia situation. But of course, when it comes to China, when it comes to Iran, um, you know, he has been as hawkish as anyone out there on those particular fronts. And I think that um, he obviously has, has had a very uh, aggressive view on American influence within South America. Um, and so I think that in particular, uh, you know, I, I think that would probably end up being a, a if, if he is a secretary of state, I think, you know, Rubio's role in South American politics and, and South American diplomacy in particular, um, and you can use diplomacy however you want in that, that context there. I, I think that is something that would definitely separate Rubio from some of the other candidates that are out there. But again, it is very interesting that at this point, we have not actually gotten official confirmation. We, we haven't gotten the, the Trump truth message out there uh, that Rubio has been indeed selected for that position. It, it might be official by the time this podcast comes out. Um, but it is interesting at the very least that that lay there and just, you know, kind of think about, you know, what are those discussions going out, uh, going on in uh, Mar-a-Lago? Yeah, I, and I think that was always really the, the best you could hope for with the Trump administration anyway, was the calculation was uh, Trump is good on one of the five or six wars that the United States is involved in, relatively good. Right. If you vote Kamala, that means you're in favor of all of the usual wars plus Ukraine escalation. And the idea was, well, if you if you vote for Trump, you're going to get most all of that anyway. But you might get a slight de-escalation in Ukraine. And that was that was it. That was what you want. That was what you want. Now, that's better. That's better than the, what Kamala offered. So I can see why even on foreign policy you would want Trump to win. Hey, maybe they might de-escalate in Ukraine and avoid World War III with the Russians. Of course, nobody was good on China. Uh, so there wasn't much to hope for there. Uh, and so, I mean, that just shows how grim the situation is if you're, uh, you're thinking, well, well, Marco isn't as bad as he could have been on Ukraine. So I guess that's movement in the right direction. And given the state of the American electorate, that's probably the best you could hope for. That's the thing is people keep losing sight of the fact that Trump isn't going to do a bunch of libertarian stuff because the American public doesn't want him to do a bunch of libertarian stuff. I, we have a lot of delusional listeners and readers who send me emails saying, now is the time for action. Everyone I talk to already agrees with me. The country's thoroughly libertarian. No, it's not. It's not, friends. We've got a lot of work to do. Those of us who work in ideological work, the, if you think that all we got to do is elect the right people, those people won't get elected. Those, you, you have people run on some hardcore libertarian position, except for they're in some very specific district and they're very good at district services, at being a congressman, at uh, communing with their constituents. They're not going to get elected and reelected. Uh, guys like Massey and Ron Paul, they were very good at doing what it took to get reelected. And they weren't primarily running on an ideological thing. They, that was a part that they weren't ashamed of. But they got reelected because they were very well connected to their constituents and they were good at speaking to their constituents. And they weren't deceiving them. It was known that they had these libertarian positions, but they gave people a reason to vote for them that was also non-ideological. And to get up there and run for president and say, yep, I'm going to slash the budget by uh, half. Nobody, if, if people actually believed it was going to do that, these people aren't going to vote for it. Senior citizens aren't going to vote for that. 
people who want a huge federal uh, welfare state aren't going to vote for that. And all those government contractors who pretend to be free market, who really rely on government spending uh, on their weapon systems that all these engineers work on and everything, all those people are on the dole, essentially, and uh, they're not going to want this libertarian candidate that we, we keep thinking is out there and we're just we're just this close to electing and that was what was behind Donald Trump. Donald Trump was not elected friends uh, on a Ron Paul type uh, platform and there is a reason for that. That's not what the majority of voters wanted. And that's, that's the reason our plans are gonna keep getting frustrated is they don't have to pander to the libertarian vote because it's not big enough. And so I'm just not shocked when I keep seeing the stuff that's non-libertarian, but apparently we have a lot of people who continue to get surprised. But of course I'm jaded, and so this doesn't affect me emotionally. You wouldn't believe the number, the amount of emails I get from people that are like, I can't believe you're you're criticizing Donald Trump. Just wait, wait until he does all the amazing things he does. And you can tell they're upset. It's like if you're still getting emotionally invested in politicians, just grow up. I mean, I just I, I, you get a free pass if you're like 25 years old. I mean, young people, they haven't been around long enough to like, right, appreciate the way things work. I mean, I've been, I've been paying close attention since the 1994. I was 16, I think, at the time, since the 1994 House uh, takeover by the Republicans. And I was really excited and all of this. I mean, guess what? It amounted to nothing. And uh, I learned over time how this stuff really works. So if you're 50 years old, you're 60 years old, and you're still getting emotionally invested in in, uh, in politicians, and you get shocked when they don't deliver some revolutionary new uh, bunch of policies, wow, get a clue. Come to reality. I mean, you're too old for this nonsense. Uh, so hopefully you can, uh, you can learn a little something this time around. Well, and, and something I think is interesting, and, and again, looking at things from beyond kind of a, an ideological lens, um, one one aspect of Trump's foreign policy, we saw it play out, and sometimes for, for the worst, depending on your, your view of the Abraham Accords, right, was the influence of family members on Trump's policies, particularly on, on foreign policy, right? Jared Kushner had a very outsized role in foreign policy. Um, he played a very active role with, you know, connecting, you know, strengthening ties with Israel and Saudi Arabia and all that sort of stuff and, and led to, to some of those agreements um, there. there. There is an interesting wild card that I think is worth mentioning when we think about some of these fronts. And that is that there's a new son-in-law in the Trump clan, um, uh, Tiffany Trump. Um, not nearly as high profile as Ivanka, but uh, Tiffany Trump um, did marry a Lebanese, a very, very wealthy Lebanese uh, gentleman. Is he um, a so Lebanese Christian? Yes. Okay. And, and so, so, it, so that, that all is one wealthy of, is the impression I get. Oh, <laughs> I don't think you marry into the Trump family if you don't, you know, there's, there's a credit check that goes into that. But, but, but that is something there, there, there has been some interesting reports out there, uh, uh, Lorient today, a few others that, uh, that, that, and, and this was part of his outreach. Cause like, that's one of the interesting things is that even though while the, the libertarian vote, um, you know, there, there was, you know, some outreach there, you had Trump at the libertarian convention, you have promises of parting Ross Ulbricht. Um, you have Bitcoin policy, which you have Bitcoin's through the roof right now, which you know we'll we'll see how that continues to go on. Um, but one of but what was interesting about Trump's campaign, just you know, from a, from a variety of perspectives, both strategic, both how it will play out, is that you know he was sending uh, mailers right to Dearborn, Michigan, um, to these very strong Arab condensed parts of particularly the Rust Belt. And you know he was getting uh, endorsements from you know Muslim leaders. He was getting endorsements from Arab leaders. He even got some endorsements from Somali leaders and the like. And one of the messages was that Trump was interested in peace, not only on the Russia-Ukraine front, but also on the Israel-Iran Middle Eastern front. And so, I, I'm, if if there is going to be a surprise factor within foreign policy, particularly given some of the names that are out there, the, the relationship of the, the son-in-law aspect, of the family di uh, diplomacy aspect of it is something I think needs to at least be acknowledged, which will not be in a form of a cabinet position. But again, that, that personal tie, having someone that has direct ties to parts of the world where a lot of, of you know, blood has been spilt, I think that is just something to, to keep in mind as we look and, and we, we, we monitor how we, we, the, the transition from policy appointments to actual foreign policy on the world stage, that you know, there are some assets out there that are not going to be baked into the cabinet itself that could pre present the opportunity for some interesting outcomes. 
Yeah, the uh, Lebanese Christian community is very interesting uh, uh, to consider where they might uh, go on this. Uh, I, the state of Israel hates Christianity in the Levant. I mean, uh, murders nuns, bombs Orthodox uh, monasteries, destroys Christian churches. Recently, went in and arrested French uh, diplomatic staff in a French-owned church in the Holy Land. I mean, no regard for Christianity. I mean, yeah, American evangelicals are useful stooges uh, in favor of the state of Israel, but historical Christianity uh, is the state of Israel loathes and has helped clean out the Christians from, say, the Bethlehem area uh, historically and, and done a lot of other damage to the Christian well, community there, which, of course, also uh, is not best friends with the Muslim community there, uh, but the the Israeli state has never offered any help at all because, of course, it's a it's a state it's an ethno state based on expunging the population of both Christians and Muslims. So, and of course, the way they're just absolutely carpet bombing uh, parts of southern Lebanon now. A lot of those are Christians. Uh, Lebanon before modern times was, boy, like 45% Christian, and that's all been gradually uh, eradicated down now to maybe, I don't know, under 20%, I think, is the situation in Lebanon right now, because a lot of them have left, much like Tiffany's husband. Uh, and, this, and of course, that's not helped uh, by the surrounding area but, uh, of the Muslim countries, but certainly not helped by the state of Israel either, which of course has no respect whatsoever for the, <laughs> for the boundaries uh, of Lebanon, which was founded by the French. Uh, it was a colony of the French, much like uh, the state of Israel started as a colony of the British to uh, preserve French influence in the region and to create sort of this Christian majority state there. It didn't go as planned. Uh, so that's a, it's an interesting community and what effect they might have in the sort of this Arab solidarity thing across religious lines. I don't know how, that's, how that will be a factor, but uh, I mean, I'm hopeful based on what you say that maybe there will be some effort to pursue some sort of negotiated peace there rather than just uh, total and complete uh, doing whatever the state of Israel says no matter what. Now, based on funding for Trump and, and his uh, proposed hires, I don't have a whole lot of hope there, but uh, you never know with Trump. I, I don't know what the situation is there. Uh, That's okay. At least we're sending Governor Huckabee over there to help... Uh help our, our diplomatic relations with Israel. With right. I mean, of course they're going to send someone like Huckabee over there. Uh, and in, in, a, in some of these cases, with guys like Huckabee, with the proposed Secretary of Defense guy, this Pete, Pete Hegseth guy, right, he's getting up there and he's, I'm seeing clips from him speaking earlier and it's it's like blast from the past stuff from the, from the Bush years with all the stuff about how uh, the uh, God gave the Holy Land to the state of Israel stuff. And there was tons of that stuff going around back in 2003, 2004, uh, when the Bush administration was really pushing a lot of this religious aspect of justifying the war on terror and the, the, the so-called plan for democracy throughout the Middle East. That was back when, see, younger people don't even remember this stuff, right? Or they weren't even alive. This was back when the Left Behind books were a huge deal and those movies were coming out, and the the modern state of Israel was supposed to be this instrumental thing in bringing about the second coming of Christ. Up, this is all crackpot religion. Uh, I mean, it has nothing to do with historical Christianity. But in the 19th century, some of these fringe Christian groups started inventing this idea that uh, that m the modern Levant is has some sort of role in uh, Christ's return. And there's nothing in Christianity. You will look in vain for 1,500 years of Christianity for something along those lines. Nobody believed that. And I don't really like talking about theology in this podcast, but if they're going to bring it up and, and to talk about all this whole God gave Israel to Abraham thing and use it as a justification to... Uh, to back up uh, modern European colonial efforts in the Levant, well, it has to be addressed. Uh, and it does turn out to be a certain important demographic of the Republican Party that's behind this stuff, a certain, a certain religious splinter group 
that is really, really gung ho in favor of this idea of supporting this modern socialist state in order to bring about certain theological ends. And I thought we had largely left that behind us uh, back with uh, the George W. Bush era. But a lot of these hires, um, they were very much enmeshed in that world when they were younger, um, like Stefanik, uh, like Waltz, uh, two of his other appointments, like uh, Hegseth, who were, were much younger back in those days but I think had breathed in a lot of that stuff from the early 2000s that related back to this religious narrative. And so I've just, I'm just hoping it's not back. I'm hoping that Trump will have zero interest in that and also maybe not be overly reliant on the evangelical Christian um, group, interest group. I'm not even sure how quite to describe it. Base, which clearly was a huge base for the Bush administration back in the day, but Trump clearly has a different base uh, than Bush did back then. It's no longer the Republican Party of 2006, 2004, where it was a bunch of blonde white women in pink suits from Southern states who made up basically the entire speaking um, uh, schedule at the, uh, at the presidential conventions in uh, 2004 and 2000. Things are, seem to be considerably different with Trump. So we'll see how the domestic politics play out for that. But definitely I'm seeing a lot of throwbacks uh, with these new appointments who are closely connected to not only Bush and uh, Cheney, but also to Lindsey Graham, who uh, has a long history going back to some of these people. I mean, these guys were all very much enmeshed in the John McCain, Lindsey Graham world in, in previous election years. And I don't know how determined that's going to be of modern work uh, from these people, but we shall see. Well, and I, I do think it's interesting, and, and you mentioned it, it's, it's the, the interesting dynamic is that you, you, you hear a lot of Bush era rhetoric, but for the most part, a lot of the the individuals in that mold, right? I think the oldest of them is is Mike Waltz, uh, who is uh, 50 years old, congressman here in Florida, and and so it's interesting that you do it, it's the same ideas, but but a, a bit of a different generation, right? It's a little bit different than you know pulling out you know like when when they, when they hired like you know uh, Bill Barr, right, as Attorney General, who you know literally worked in you know the Bush and Reagan administrations. These are some some different people there, and I think there's a high priority. You know, typically, the one one of the strong characteristics of these hires has been, um, you know, the perception of loyalty to Trump himself since 2016, you know, Rubio, as with many of the, many such cases uh, with people in the primaries, uh, had, had a very, uh, uh, you know, very uh, aggressive campaign against Trump and then came in the fold thereafter and stayed with it. So but it is interesting, though, because like, that's one of the things that you've seen is that, you know, the the, the Republicans in general uh, less were represented within the elected class, but definitely far um, better signified by, say, the, the the pundits and kind of the intellectual class and things like that, is that there, there tends to be a fairly stark generational divide on these issues. Um, Tucker Carlson had an interview um, last week with a, a foreign policy advisor um, who made the point that you know, basically all the, the people of his age, um, uh, Cor uh, uh, Eldridge Colby, um, whose grandfather was a CIA director, but you know, neither here nor there. Um, but he, but he, he talked about this, this generational divide that he has seen within foreign policy. And again, it's interesting that we are, we're getting younger personnel, but not necessarily that, that ideological jump there. Um, though, again, if we're looking for some, some promises there, um, J.D. Vance is kind of, particularly on the, on the Iran situation, you know, has, has you know, I, I remember immediately after his nomination, he, he was on Fox News talking about, you know, something that, that sounded quite, quite similar to bomb, bomb Iran. Um, and then, you know, <laughs> later on in the campaign said, well, you know, Israeli interests and American interests will not always overlap. We don't want a war with Iran. Um, Trump, when given the opportunity to talk about regime change in Iran, um, didn't you know, uh, push back on that and said basically, you know, we need to take off our own stuff. We don't need to be you know, dealing with that. So again, it, it, it is interesting you know, seeing this this larger ideological change within this movement, a, a movement that Trump has been a catalyst for. Um, you know, there, there's still a lot of polarizing views within the foreign policy umbrella and, and how that plays out. And that's why particularly the, the Michael Waltz pick, I, I, I was kind of expecting him to be um, defense secretary and not national security advisor. 
and and I, I think you know in, in part because like Waltz, um, you know, d during his congressional hearings, one of the things he actually has been good on, like if we're, if we're looking for promising things there, um, you know, he has, he has done a lot of work on waste within the Pentagon, right? There's this kind of viral clip of him like holding up a, a bag full of like basic uh, parts and talking about how like we're spending like ninety thousand dollars on like you know nine dollar parts, um, you know, for for you know equipment and things like that, and and um, so like. Trying to so there's there's the one aspect of foreign policy itself. There's the other aspect of kind of bureaucratic management, um, which again, well, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, I, I've got if if if, if you're if you're better out there, I would, I would bet the under on uh, Pete Hegseth getting uh, the actually confirmed in the Senate, um, regardless of one's opinion on him. I'm not trying to make a strong opinion one way or another about his, his merit there, but I have a feeling that he's not going to fly um, amongst the Senate confirmation period. I mean, it's it's you know who can who can actually go after some of these. These very large, I mean, in the Pentagon in particular, what three million employees? I mean, the the biggest bureaucracy in the world. Um, you know that aspect, that skill set, um, which could be separate from foreign policy in terms of an internal standpoint. There, that that's really where you kind of really need the big guns. And so far, I think it's a valid question on whether or not uh, there's enough influence there on the the bureaucratic side. Um, you know, the, the government efficiency side, the Doge side, right, applied directly within these positions on where that skill set is really being seen right now. And I do think a lot of it will depend on what turns out to be really the most influential pressure groups. Now, we, of course, we all know about the Washington blob, and that is extremely powerful, and they're not giving up power easily, and they're going to make their, uh, their opinions felt in Washington. Of course, there is, of course, the Israel lobby as well, which is part of the blob, and will be very influential. The question is, is... Will there be enough of Trump's core, uh, his core voters, that is his core supporters, that he needs to get legislation passed and such, who will be either indifferent enough about a lot of these foreign policy stuff or actually calling for retrenchment, that is some sort of retreat from uh, all of this international uh, aggression that the U.S. has been involving itself in for, for many decades. and. I think that's the way you fight then a lot of these these bureaucrats that are being appointed, right? We can look and see that ideologically they're all bad. Um, the question is, are they ideologically bad because they feel it in their heart of hearts? Or are they ideologically bad because that's what served them in terms of their careers, right? Like, of course... Hegseth is going to go up and say what Lindsey Graham and John McCain want him to say a decade ago uh, because that's going to help his career. I mean, the cockroaches go where the garbage is. And so if the, if the garbage, uh, if the tasty garbage is saying, yes, we want war with Iran, yes, uh, we want uh, increases in defense spending, we want more aggressive foreign policy, then that's what the cockroaches are going to say. Uh, however, if thanks to voter pressure uh, or just a um, a victorious voter coalition, a, co a ruling coalition of interest groups and voters that that de-emphasizes the importance of aggressive foreign policy, then the cockroaches are going to go to a different sort of garbage and they're going to say different sorts of things. And so if they are true careerists, which is certainly described some of these people at least, they're going, to, they're going to do, their ideology is going to become whatever makes them more upwardly mobile uh, within the regime. So it's, a lot of it's going to depend on what Trump determines is to his advantage and what people who want to ride Trump's coattails in the future are going to determine is to their advantage. And I don't know what that's going to look like yet. I mean, we really do have to give the administration some time to do this. But let's not make the mistake of attributing deep principle to any of these people one way or the other. Um, I always just kind of throw up in my mouth a little bit when I hear someone talk about how President so-and-so is, in his heart, he's a good man. Right. But, and then they go on to explain to me why they're awful. Bombing children. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> Spare me. Okay, I don't want to hear about what a good man President so-and-so is. Uh, so let's, yeah, let's just keep a, a nice cynical eye on where things are going with and, this administration and maybe get a better sense of things. And, and part of that, if we think about the ecosystem, uh, the garbage, as you put it, um, <laughs> you know, the... Yeah, you know, there have been some notable changes that, you know, that are worth noting, right? Um, you, you can see this in a variety of ways, right? One, one, one easy example is, you know, 
2012, right? Who, what were the, the, the major uh, public opinion mouthpieces of conservatism, of, of you know, Republican politics? You know, what, what was the content that your average Republican uh, politician, to the extent that you have politicians at all that actually read anything, right? Which is a whole other category. But you, you, you do have a few, you have a category. What content are they reading? Back then in the day, right, it would have been the Weekly Standard, it would have been National Review, it would have been your traditional, you know, neoconservative, Buckleyite, you know, proud institutions, right, that, that all got thrown out the window, right? I, I have a feeling the number of, of Republicans in Washington reading uh, National Review is at an all-time low, uh, higher than it should be, I have no doubt, but still at an all-time low. And now it's, you know, what is, you know, how, how concerned are they about getting blasted by Tucker Carlson on X. Now, one worth noting is that they're probably less concerned about that today than it was Tucker Carlson on Fox News. So you can argue that, you know, for any other uh, benefits that might be seen of the alternative media landscape, right, you know, they're, 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 that was a particularly powerful bully pulpit when it was connected to Fox News and that as a major driver of uh, Republican base opinion. Um, you know, back in the, you know, you get, think of like Rush Limbaugh and talk radio and the way that that played as well. It's kind of, you know, definitely is not what it used to be. Uh, but, but you still have Tucker out there. Tucker is still someone that is consumed. Tucker has been very, very strong on a lot of these issues. I mean, he's become even, you know, perhaps even stronger than he was on Fox News in terms of his personal positions on that. He's had some, a lot of great stuff kind of re constantly repeating the very true point. Uh, that the, the the very real consequence of American foreign policy since World War II has been the death of Christians around the world, um, something I think even J.D. Vance has picked on as well. Um, and so you, that that is a, a source of influence that needs to be that that it, it would be interesting to see how that translates into creating the incentives for these careerist, you know, for these ambitious politicians and the way sh they shape things. Um, and that broader podcast network as well. But beyond that, beyond simply the informational side of things, you know, we have still um, get, you know, the Heritage Foundation for, for any other problems that exist there on foreign policy have taken a, a big change in directions there. They're a lot more realist than, for, than the neoconservative than they used to be on the foreign policy front. You've seen other little um, platforms pop up from that. The Project 2025, which you know was a scary word during the campaign. Um, there's a lot of very interesting, kind of very serious plans there, both in terms of the bureaucratic side of things, uh, the intelligence agencies in particular. Um, someone who is worth mentioning, um, and someone who, who seemed to got a pretty um, a broad uh, praise um, from different factors was uh, uh, Radcliffe getting named as CIA director. Um, someone who has been very, very critical of uh, past, you know, he's been willing to criticize people within the blob, um, someone who did serve out, I think he finished his term the last time around as, I think, national security advisor for Trump or in a, in a similar sort of role. Um, he's seen as both a, a, um, a reformer, a, a critic of the status quo when it comes to CIA, which is pretty important, um, and, but also someone who is a doer, who has the, the um, you know, maturity understanding of institutions. I, he was a former congressman as well, um, but someone who, who actually kind of knows where the levers are there. And so again, that might be, again, you, if you get a really, you know, if, if you get a, a, a CIA director that is particularly interested in shaking things up, right? Like that, that is a pretty important piece on the board. Should you get that follow through there? And that's the interesting thing is that I think there's enough of that ecosystem around it where trying to be that disruptive force will not lead you to uh, a, a quick retirement in the face of the beltway that there actually might be institutional support there. So again, like that, that it's possibility you know, may end up getting, you know, nothing changed, right? Like, you know, that's all, always the, the, the uh, should be the betting favorite is uh, you know, nothing ever happens crowd. Um, but that is something to be to to be mindful of that you know some of that ecosystem mm -hmm. around um, has changed in the last four, eight, twelve years, depending on where you want to start that narrative that that is is at least interesting and, and worth acknowledging as we you know view the uh, next four years going on. Well, I think the good aspects of the narrative go back to 2008, 2012. I, I really, I think a lot of its intellectual roots are in the Ron Paul movement. Uh, the intellectual roots of that, of course, are the Mises Institute. I mean, Ron Paul and the Mises Institute, when you want to go into ideology, are basically the same thing. And it was the success, I think, of that movement, the anti-establishment nature of that movement that has filtered down to us today through people like Tucker Carlson. 
And, and to that point where we were talking about the generational divide there, I mean, it, it's a very real possibility. And when we saw one example, uh, Abe Hamada, uh, who was just uh, won his congressional seat in Arizona, uh, he was a, a Ron Paul forum poster back when he was a teenager. And I think that is one of the interesting things that, you know, it's not happening as quickly as we want because people in political power don't like to leave their seats as, as long as, you know, from their cold dead hands and sometimes literally. Um, you know, I, I think that will be interesting that as more younger generations filter through the political ranks, Ron Paul is going to be a, a overrepresentative based off of his uh, you know, so it's, it's the primary performance mm -hmm. right in the national campaign. When you just remember, recall like, how many young Republicans that end up going through that process, that end up jumping into the arena for better or for worse, many of them, even if they have, even if they, even if they might not be, you know, as as rabid as they were in their younger days, a lot of them still grew up consuming. You know, Ron Paul's de you know, debate with Giuli Rudy Giuliani, like that, that is a, a generational shift that I think is real. And we're starting to see fruits born from that um, as, as slow as that process might be. Well, the fact is, is that these appointments aren't as bad as they were in the first term. Uh, when uh, Trump was just more unmoored and clueless. Uh, and I think we can attribute the fact that there's been any growth on this issue. As you note, right, a lot of it is due to pressure out of the podcasting world, the anti-establishment podcasting world. And that's the origins in that are in this larger anti-establishment movement of that, that surrounds Ron, essentially, and filters down through him and some of that influence is being felt today. Now, I said earlier in this podcast that we still have a long way to go in terms of changing the ideology of this country. But boy, I don't even want to think about what the ideology would be in the United States if it had not been for the unexpected high degree of success of the Ron Paul movement. People forget how many millions of votes Ron got in the primaries that year and just the general influence felt, especially uh, among young people. And just let's note, by the way, uh, to fill out your theory, about how uh, the uh, <laughs> the anti-establishment thing kind of filtered down into a certain age group. The uh, one of my favorite things, one of my favorite facts this uh, this election is the age breakdown on who is voting for Trump versus Kamala. And I saw in a you probably have more details on this, but I saw it a couple of different places. The age breakdown was basically over 65, very Kamala, very very pro Kamala or whatever. And, okay, yep, that's the pro-welfare, pro-status quo group is the oldsters. And then the millennials, uh, who have always struck me as unusually authoritarian, um, very, uh, very pro-Kamala. But then you got the 18 to 25 age group <laughs> went pro-Trump uh, by like 53, 54 percent. And then the Gen X group, uh, a lot of us, of course, were very influenced by Ron Paul. Uh, went Trump as well. Uh, so I don't, I don't know what, what to make of that, but it certainly at least fits with your theory. Well, and, and what's interesting too is that even if you look at, at millennials, I have, to, I have to stand up for, for, for my people. My, <laughs> my, uh, uh, like, when, you, when you think about it as well, like that was the Obama generation, right? And, and so if you look at the millennials, I mean, it, it was roughly, I mean, uh, and, and exit polls take with a grain of salt, right? There'll be a Gallup poll that comes out later. There'll be a lot, a lot more detail and sort of stuff. But, you know, I've seen stuff that basically that, that the person that voted for Obama in college in 2008 and 2012 was, was pretty much like a 50-50 split, you know, 45-55, something around those lines um, this time around. So, again, you, you've even seen that and, and you know, that sort of movement. And you had plenty of people that voted for Obama but kind of thought Ron Paul was, was interesting, right? So like, that taps into that as well. Um, and, 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 of course, you know, Obama was the, the change candidate of that time. I mean, promises, you know, fulfillment of promises aside, right? That was, you know, that, that was definitely a, 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 a drumbeat that played into it. And so, again, I, I think you, you are seeing, you know, this, it, 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 you know, DC is always the last place where changing sentiments of the population translates into reality there. Um, and and, and I, I think one of the interesting measurements here and I, I know you brought it up in, in your article uh, uh, you know, uh, critiquing some of the early things here, is, is I think one of the best measurements of uh, capital that's been built up, um, uh, you know, see, seeing this from a, from a personnel standpoint, is what does Tulsi Gabbard get out of this? Now, Tulsi Gabbard, you know, she was a Democrat until, you know, what, two weeks ago, 
right? You know, someone who, who com comes from the Bernie bro side of Democrat politics, someone who, who has reinvented herself, but, you know, always anti-establishment, got thrown out of her position with the DNC um, for, for calling out uh, the, the institutional cor corruption there, has been, you know, kind of more of a, an, an alt media influencer since she's left Congress uh, since her 2020 run than anything else. But but she at the very least personifies I think you know there, there's it's, it's incredible you talk to you know I, I can talk to young Republicans I can talk to Boomer Republicans um, you know people really like Tulsi um, I think there's a variety of reasons for that I think there's a you know e either you like her for anti-war views either you like the fact that she served you know that, that she's a service member right kind of kind of hits both both different things there and I, it's gonna be very interesting to see how does Trump reward a former Democrat someone who was vocally critical of him not that long ago, someone who endorsed Biden after stopping, stepping out of the 2020 election, right? You know, someone who does not have a tremendous amount of capital place as a longtime um, sycophant, for lack of a better word, someone who did campaign very hard for him this election cycle, this is true, but someone who does not have a longtime presence within that orbit, um, you know, but, but has, has presented herself as, as, a, as a face, you know, I know there'll be criticisms out there of, of how, how sincere that is, it's fine, whatever, this is politics. Um, but how is she rewarded in this? Because again, I think that will be kind of, you know, again, Trump trying to have this central casting style, this, uh, you know, this, this, this diverse you know, outfit here, how someone like that is placed within the administration. In fact, I just saw a tweet that she's a favorite for a, uh, a national, uh, director of national intelligence, which would be a pretty big win, right? If she's ambassador to India, not a very big win. So I, I think that's kind of the realm of possibilities there. And again, I think that will be just be interesting in seeing, you know, it's like in, 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 the, in the NFL, NFL teams lie to their fans all the time, but it's, it's when the draft comes and it's when free agency comes where they actually have to spend capital out there, you know, exactly what they actually think about their team. Some of, the, some of these additional positions that will make up this foreign policy sphere, where these, some of these interesting players fit there. We can have another conversation about RFK and domestic policy. There's, there's, there's a few of these little litmus tests to see how much of the political rhetoric translates into cashing in chips of political capital for real wins. And I think Tulsi, when it comes to foreign policy, is going to be one of those very clear, obvious signs into how much of that is actually valued with the administration going forward. Well, and what you're just saying also illustrates the uselessness of people who don't want to criticize the administration at all. Like the whole point of all of this is to put pressure on the administration. So if they're if he's appointing a bunch of neocon guys we don't like, you need to say you need to voice your displeasure and say, OK, you need to do better with your next appointment. Uh, and oh, well, yes, okay, this guy wasn't great. And here's why. If you just if you take this whole, oh, Trump's my hero and I approve everything he does, we just need to let him work because he's doing 40. All that means is that they appoint somebody who's pretty bad and you say nothing. What that tells them is they can get away with someone worse the next time. So you need to say something. And, and the other side of it is that, you know, I mean, Trump does get pushback. He does get criticism at the very least powerful liaisons around Trump do get that feedback from the powers that be internally. They, 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 don't, they don't do it on X, right? You know, yeah, you don't, don't think you, he's getting criticism from the yes. other side, right? right? I mean, if you don't think that's going on, you're very wrong. Right. And so that's where you, you definitely need that counterbalance. And that's, that's why I, I, I think that one of the biggest mistakes of the first time around you know, was, was Trump became president and he stopped doing rallies. And I, good reasons for that, right? You know, there's, there's a lot of time that goes into that. But, but like, you know, Trump is at his best when he's feeding off his audience because Trump's audience is better than the people that are around Trump. And like that, like, again, like that, that it's, it's the, it, Lee Rockwell's great quote, right? The, the Jeffersonians were better than Jefferson. Uh, the, the Taftyites were better than Taft. The Reaganites were better than Reagan. And the Trumpians are better than Trump. And, and I think that is, you can, the, that, 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 that feedback, you know, that being able to read that room, and, and that's one of the nice things, like Trump you know, goes around Mar-a-Lago and asks like, you know, random guests and, you know, his, his, uh, you know, his janitor, like, you know, who should be vice president, right? It, that, that, that is a, an interesting dynamic of this broader Trump phenomenon is, the, his, is his sensitivity to both criticism, praise, and just feedback from people outside of your traditional blobs that typically dictate decisions at this capacity. Yeah, and it's important to remember that uh, Rothbard viewed as the model, the methods of the abolitionists, which was basically, they never lost sight of what the ultimate goal was, and they tolerated uh, piecemeal victories, right? Obviously they were going to tolerate um, say a piece of legislation that outlawed slavery in the territories, right? That didn't give them their 
overall goal, but they're like, hey, it's a step in the right direction. We're not going to say that's enough, but okay. Great, we'll go along with that. But what they never did was, of course, oh, well, so this 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 politician, as long as he's not like the most pro-slavery person on earth, then then we'll accept it, right? Because we don't want to make the uh, the perfect the enemy of the good. So we'll just accept whatever's going on, so long as it's it's uh, just not the absolute worst option. That's not how that works. You need to push and push and push back against the stuff you don't like and push, push, push in favor of the stuff you do like with no regard for hurting the feelings of a politician or thinking that you might somehow damage their prospects or whatever. That's not how successful ideological movements work. They always push for more and they never stop. That's why the left is so successful. They always push for more and they never stop, even when it's against their own quote unquote people, right? Like the Nancy Pelosi's of the world or whatever. They, they always push for more. And so I just I, I just roll my eyes and delete these emails from these people like, oh, you shouldn't criticize Trump at all. No, that's just not the way you win. Uh, and and so it's our job to really just continue to point out these people, uh, what's wrong with them, what we need more of. And by pointing out that we don't like somebody, that we're not saying that uh, the <laughs> – say – that if they appointed anyone other than a Ron Paul clone, that we can't live with it? Well, of course we could live with it, but there's a lot of space between Michael Waltz and Ron Paul. And to claim that <laughs> that basically, oh, yeah, if this guy, if, if, if sudden, suddenly this person ran in the Ron Paul direction, that we wouldn't applaud that? Of course we would applaud that. We would applaud movement in the right direction. That doesn't make it enough. That doesn't mean that it's now beyond reproach. Uh, so I'm just amazed at uh, just how many people seem to think, okay, well, the election happened, so, so now, therefore, we back off and we're not involved in the political process anymore. We don't have anything to say about it anymore. And that's just entirely the wrong attitude. I agree. All right. Well, uh, I would just like to note that uh, we, uh, we, we still got a long way to go on a lot of these... <laughs> Appointments, right? I mean, I don't know what's going to happen over the next few weeks, so we shall see. I mean, we'll come back to us. I probably don't want to. Let's give them a couple of a couple of months um, to uh, to get a, a, some some more data in here because I just don't have a good sense of what the administration is planning. And also, I just want to see what the podcasting world is going to say uh, over the next uh, few weeks well, as well. Well, one thing we can be certain of is that the support from the Republican legislature for radical change will not be particularly strong. Um, from the House, it uh, looks like Speaker John- uh, Michael Johnson's going to continue to be Speaker of the House. That's probably going to be better than Paul Ryan because I think you know, Johnson's going to be a pure sycophant and um, you know, he'll have fun managing those cats there with a very thin majority. Um, but at least he's not an active uh, push. You know, he's not going to actively be a, a hindrance. Um, to any any major things going, being done like Paul Ryan was, but I uh, just saw that uh, again. N- n- not that I want to you know, toot like Rick Scott as some sort of great bastion of um, of uh, fixing everything right in, in Washington, but he failed the Senate Majority Leader race, the first ballot, and so uh, the, the Senate Majority Leader after McConnell is going to be a McConnell clone, whether that is the uh, the the explicitly. Uh, hostile to his base, John Cornyn, who is a, a particularly dumb and particularly sinister, or John Thune, who is similarly, sin- similarly sinister, but at least uh, capable enough to hold his tongue and be quiet about it. Now, there's a valid argument to be, you know, would, you, would you have the explicit over the, the silent um, in terms of the disdain view they have for the base? I think it's a valid co- conversation to have, um, but those are the two choices there. I'm sure we'll have an outcome by the time this podcast is out, but um, yeah, that was a uh, yeah, the Republican Senate is going to continue to do Republican things, and um, there, there's been no great revolution, at least when it comes to our highest chamber uh, here in here in D.C. All right. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up this episode of Radio Rothbard. Thanks for listening. Appreciate your support. Uh, make sure, speaking of support, uh, if you like this sort of thing, make sure and go to Mises.org and either become a member or subscribe. You can become a member, of course, for 100 bucks a year, and you will get... Uh, You'll get more interaction with us, invitations to events. You'll get our print publication that goes out every other month. Uh, but if 
If you're too cheap to do that, then just click on subscribe, <laughs> and then you can get on our mailing list, and uh, you, then you'll just get you'll you'll learn about new articles, uh, you'll learn about events, and you can choose just a weekly. You don't have to get a daily um, uh, email, just a weekly one. I know people get tons of stuff in their inbox, so uh, I recommend you do that, and you'll get more of this content every week. Um, but until next time, thank you for listening to. Radio Rothbard, and we'll see you then.